Welcome back to the Telecom TV Summit on Open Telco Infra and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of two live Q&A shows. We have our final programme for you tomorrow at the same time. Now, earlier today, you've just seen it in fact, we held a panel discussion that looked at the emergence of open telco infrastructure. And we've already received a lot of questions from you on this topic. And I'm pleased to say that several of our panelists are back to help answer them during this live show. Now, if you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now and use the Q&A form right here on the website. As always, your co-host for the show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Ray, we've had a full day already today. So many guests and a lot of discussion. Any questions that are still outstanding or any areas that you expect our audience will want to explore further? Uh, well, Guy, there are lots of questions still outstanding and there will be for some time, I think. Uh, even if you took just one part of the overall telco infrastructure, and looked at the impact that open networking could have, you should really have a list of questions as long as your arm. And we're looking at every aspect of the communications networking architecture here, and every part is a little bit different in how open interfaces and disaggregation might play a role. In general, I'll be gobsmacked if we don't get multiple questions about systems integration and total cost of ownership, or TCO because uh, that's where the heat is really. Yeah, absolutely, you're right there. Thanks, Ray. Uh, and those certainly are the key questions at the moment. So on with the show. Let's now meet our guests who are eager to help with all of your questions, questions that are as long as Ray's arm. Joining us live on the programme today are Jeff Hollingworth, Chief Marketing Officer for Rakuten Symphony, Beth Cohen, SDN Product Strategies at Verizon, Sandro Tavares, Director, Telecom Systems Marketing at Dell Technologies. Paul Miller, Chief Technology Officer for Wind River. John Baldry, Director of Metro Marketing with Infineera. And joining us live from the One Summit in Seattle, Rani Haby, CTO, Networking, Edge and Access at the Linux Foundation. Hello, everyone. It's very good to see you all. You know, there's so many questions to get through today, as always. But first, I'm going to hand over to you, Ray. OK, thanks, Guy. Um, so, Rani, it's early morning in Seattle, uh, and we can see that you're about to start the final day of the Linux Foundation Networking's one event. Any key takeaways for us from that event? Anything that relates to our open telco infra theme? Yeah, sure. So first of all, there was a great turnout of people. It's still, as you said, a bit early here in Seattle, but people are gathering in for the second day. Uh, but we have hundreds of people here on the floor and attending the keynotes. Um, so it's still generating a lot of interest uh, in the industry. Uh, I think one of the highlights of the event yesterday was uh, the announcement of a new project named Silva, in which several of the key tier one European operators uh, launched a project to deal with the implementation of building a telecom infra that is following uh, current standards and kind of inheriting from existing open source projects, but really focuses on the implementing uh, of the infrastructure, how to do it in a way that is compliant with uh, certain requirements, uh, some of them specific to the EU, uh, some of them are more general like security and energy consumption. Uh, so we're really excited about this project and it's really a part of a bigger trend that we're seeing of um, more interest in end-to-end -end solutions and not just specific open source projects that uh, address one or two problems, but really uh, solutions that can be deployed by the communication service providers. So that was, I think, uh, one of the big themes of the event so far. Uh, also blurring the lines between 
the different technologies, uh, for example, between networking and edge. We had a keynote from uh, Igal Elbaz, the CTO of AT&T, who said something along the lines of there's no 5G network without edge. So we're saying that uh, technologies like open networking and open edge have to go hand in hand and provide these end-to-end -end solutions that everybody is, uh, is expecting. Okay, excellent, Rani. Thanks so much. Now, Beth, you are there in Seattle uh, as well. Uh, any key takeaways from you that are, are relevant to today's discussions? Oh, I'll build on on what Rani said. Um, you know, I'm very interested in the uh, uh, Sylvia pro project. Obviously, I've been uh, highly active as a co-chair of the Anikit project. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, I, I know there's a number of operators who have been active in the Anikit project are also on the Sylvia project. So we need to make sure that, you know, we're fully in alignment uh, with those two projects. Um, and I was also um, interested in the NIFO, NIFIO project, uh, which uh, has some interesting ramifications, um, which I think it is also related to some of the other projects, uh, ONAP and, uh, and Anakit as well, and Sylvia for that matter. Um, so I think um, uh, I also looked at the, uh, uh, checked in with the Sonic project, which is quite interesting. That's uh, a uh, basically network operating, an open source network uh, operating system. Um, so yeah, it's very, uh, you know, I'm happy to be here and, uh, and uh, it's, there's been a lot of excitement and I think they'll, you know, open source is absolutely the future. So, or, or maybe I could even say it's already here. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks Beth and Rani, both doubling up uh, two summits today, one here with us and then one in, uh, in person in Seattle. Um, so Guy, we can move on from Seattle and come to our first uh, audience question. Uh, of today's program. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Ray. Uh, you know, as we just heard, there is so much, so much going on in this sector. It's amazing. Um, right. Here's our first question we've received. Uh, so let me uh, let me read this out. Before deciding on open infrastructure, do operators need to see the capex and opex benefits first when judged alongside traditional implementations? Because, for example. Open RAN evangelists keep saying that Open RAN improves CAPEX and OPEX compared to traditional solutions, which doesn't always seem to be the case. So, you know, our, our questioner there, our viewer is, is, has focused in on Open RAN, but certainly this is a, a, applicable across um, all open networking. Um, Paul, I wonder if we could uh, start with some thoughts from yourself on, um, you know, I guess yes is the, is the basic answer. The operators do need to see some commercial benefits. Yes, absolutely true. Uh, you're not going to escape the TCO uh, discussion with any opportunity that you have in this space. As we talk with uh, operators globally, that's first first uh, first thought in their mind, right? Is, is the cost basis for acquiring and then operating the network, CapEx and OpEx considerations. Uh, what we're seeing is there's certain attributes of not only the technology, but the partners that you choose with respect to the skill levels of the personnel, as well as technology attributes that can drive down CapEx and OpEx considerations, you know, what type of processors, memory and storage you need at the edge, you know, there's a cost factor there, how many nodes you need in the network, uh, the networking bandwidth and automation aspects of it really have a significant effect on the OpEx. Um, so yeah, absolutely, TCO is, is first and foremost in the operator's minds. Um, also, we do see some more advanced operators thinking about forward-looking revenue streams coming from a lot of OT applications that can be hosted on a virtualized network once built with ORAN or VRAN approaches that do factor into their total TCO analysis as well. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, John, uh, are your thoughts along similar lines? You know, is, is a TCO uh, Im imperative here is the overriding um, um, factor when, when telcos look to choose open networking equipment? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, the focus I come from is very much the optical layer. And if you think back to the panel we had earlier, Jeff gave a really good example of how the open aspects of programmability could be applied to an optical layer. Um, and there's also then the economic angle as well. And to really address that, you really have to understand the ultimate goal that where the 
open architecture with a line system from vendor A, an optical line system from the first vendor, maybe some transponders from that vendor, and then a new wave of innovation comes along and you may choose to use uh, technology from, from another vendor. There should be quite a simple mathematics to show lower cost per bit with the new technology, but there's always the hurdle of enabling those open interfaces, enabling the environment where the operational procedures, the management environment can go such that you can build that multi-vendor environment. So there's, there's work that has to be done. You know, obviously the, those of us on the vendor community can help operators with that, um, but that has to all be as assessed so you can understand where you're going to get to and the steps you need to take to get there. And obviously the, you know, the economics of all of those are, are, are very critical in that discussion. Yeah, thanks very much, John. As you say, there, there are a lot of factors inv involved in, in the decision making and uh, deciding to go down this route and then implementing. Uh, Beth, uh, are you seeing a, a, a similar thing from your perspective, from an operator's perspective? Uh, because I guess also it's one thing for um, a vendor of, of open networking equipment to say, yes, it does improve OPEX and CAPEX, but you know, where's the proof? Uh, very much we we look to where is the proof and, and uh, you know, uh, as as with the cloud, you know, the move to cloud infrastructure, it's it's um, there has been some cost savings uh, shown, or have, or in many cases, it, there's no cost savings. It's equal. However, the added dimension, which I think is important, so much important to the operators, to to us, is that it gives us more flexibility. Traditionally, you know. We're very capex oriented companies. We have a lot of infrastructure that we have to support. It's expensive, uh, expensive to maintain. You know, the total cost of ownership is another factor that we need to to take into consideration. And uh, you know, open source can you know provide some of that. Um, you know, relieve some of that. On the other hand, you have to treat it differently. You know, you, um, it, it requires different skills to run it. Uh, you need to have people that are comfortable working with open source. We, you, you know, um, you need to. Uh, open source tends to have, um, you know, really good components, and then sort of weird gaps where you know whoever's interested in, in the in the good components doesn't think about the, the other piece that's needed. So you know we have to you know, kind of cover over those weird gaps, uh, you know, particularly around tooling. Um, uh, management tools tends to be uh, tends to be an area that open source is not great at. Um, and again, it has to do with, you know, how the communities work. Um, so all of that is taken into consideration. And of course, that all, you know, that goes into our CapEx and OpEx and, and financial considerations of the overall cost of ownership of, um, you know, using open source components. Obviously, we do use open source components in our infrastructures. Um, we're going to continue that for a long time. I think it's going to grow, uh, but you know, it's it's not a hundred percent. You know, just pushing pencils and bean and counting beans. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for those insights, Beth. Um, Jeff, we'll come to you in a moment. But first, I just want to go to to Sandro uh, and get Sandro's views on this. Sandro. I totally second what Beth just said, right? So uh, when we're looking into the deployment of this infrastructure and uh, the analysis that we have to make, it's not only you know uh, about like the basic service that initially you're going to provide, but you need to consider also the the platform that you're building for further innovation and launching new services, right? So. We're at a point of our industry that this is not only about providing connectivity in the future, but actually becoming full-blown service providers uh, that are also going to be uh, providing applications to enterprises, enabling new business models, automation, and so on. So at the end of the day, the TCO analysis, which for sure is important, and uh, we're never going to get out of, uh, of this discussion, but it needs to consider not only uh, uh, year one uh, apples by apples comparison of the infrastructure that used to be deployed and the new one that is going to be deployed, but all, it has to also consider all of the additional things that are going to be able to be, that CSPs are going to be able to do leveraging this new infrastructure. So 
Yeah, the TCO analysis is important, but it's a, a much wider analysis than simply looking into one single workload. Ah, interesting. Thanks very much for, for those comments, Sandro. And uh, we'll just wrap this up with some extra comments from Jeff. Yeah, very quickly, and just building on what Sandro said, actually, I, I mean, in Rakuten, we have saved uh, many both OPEX and CAPEX, uh, and that's been independently verified. But in no means does that mean that everyone's going to save the same amount of money. Uh, it, it's not a case of taking what we've done and transposing it as a one-size-fits-all. I think the truth is that there's a lot more levers that are available now to, uh, to change, to move. And then the TCO is much more complicated than perhaps the traditional procurement channels are established to manage in terms of normal procurement. So I, if I... If I want to build my own house, it's going to be a lot cheaper than paying somebody else to do it, as long as I know how to build a house. If you don't know how to build a house, that's a catastrophic TCO, probably, and you should pay somebody else to do it. And it's, it's a much better uh, end result that you receive. Great analogy there, Jeff. Thanks very much for, for those um, comments. Thank you all uh, for, for that. It's a good question and great set of answers. Um, so, Ray, let's um, head over to you for uh, another audience question. OK, thanks, Guy. We'll, we'll swing back to Jeff at the end of the program to find out if he has, in fact, built his own house. But we'll, we'll get to that later because uh, we've got another audience question here. And uh, so this one is, while open disaggregated networks enable new architectures, the compute and storage fundamentals stay the same, and so do the challenges of scale and energy consumption. To really make networks more efficient and applicable to next generation networking, do we really need a new approach to compute and storage rather than disaggregation? Um, so is the industry really focusing uh, on the wrong thing. Um, Jeff, maybe we can start with you on this one. I really like this question because I think it highlights part of a disease that we have in telecom where we, got, we get obsessed with thinking the topic we're discussing is the answer in entirety rather than it just being part of the ingredients that you use to bake a cake. Uh, I think all technologies as they evolve are really playing into a modeling criteria of how do we maximize utilization of those technologies and reduce the cost of them. Now, Intel has been doing this for, we were working with Intel 10 years ago on a, a rack scale architecture where they completely disaggregate storage, compute, uh, and memory into separate component boards. It was called the rack scale architecture. And the reason they could do that is because they could insert photonics and fiber between at the component level of a computer. So we were designing data center sized computers. The reason we did that was so that there wasn't islands of compute memory uh, and uh, network that were not utilized. Uh, so it's all about using all of these tools together in a way that makes the best result and the best economic. And, and open isn't new. The vendor community, when I was working in Ericsson in the 90s, we were using open source technology. It's a tool to actually help you build something. Now what happens is it's more transparent. There's more optionality in the projects that exist, but you still have to understand how to put those together. Okay, excellent, Jeff. Thanks very much. Now you're bringing baking into it as well as building houses. Uh, this is a very domesticated theme here today. Uh, Sandro, let's come to you. Yeah, well, first of all, I couldn't agree more with Jeff, right? So, uh, and, and adding on top of that, this is a discussion that, of course, I mean, uh, the silicon technology will continue to evolve. Right, so uh, CPUs are gonna get better. This is just a fact of life. Uh, in terms of adding new uh, capabilities into the equation as well, we have acceleration solutions popping up. 
that especially like for open RAN, they're going to help narrow the gap between the traditional systems and the, and the disaggregated systems. But regardless of all that, uh, these discussions not only about peak performance, right? Performance is one of the angles that we need to look into, but this is not uh, the only reason why we are looking into disaggregation. The, the whole story around disaggregation is also about providing uh, a wider uh, array of, uh, first of all, providing more flexibility, right? Uh, for new services to be built and then eventually providing a wider array of options, uh, allowing for new players to come into this market so we actually can speed up innovation. Uh, being very, very honest and doing kind of a self-assessment of the industry, the te telecommunications industry innovates at a, at a much slower pace than some other industries, right? And this is something that we need to change. Uh, and disaggregation actually opens the space for that. So the, the establishment of open standards opens the space for faster innovation, more players in the, in, in the, in the field, right? So and that's, that's what we should be looking at. Okay, thanks, Sandro. Uh, and uh, Beth, we'll come to you next. This question is really, um, uh, eliciting a lot of responses here from our panel. So, uh, Beth, what do you think? Um, I don't know where to start. So, so I, I question Sandro's uh, comment that the telecom industry is is innovating. Uh, we are innovating very quickly, certainly faster than we used to, uh, but we're innovating in in ways that aren't necessarily seen by our customers. Uh, you know, the five G rollout, and you know, we're already talking about six G. Um, you know, that's fundamentally changing how people consume uh, the network. Uh, we have, you know, we're seeing uh, an edge, of course, another another use case where, where the network is being consumed in vastly different ways, which is forcing us to innovate to support that. Um, in terms of, of the, the fundamental question, uh, I think there's some truth to the question, which is that, um, you know, we're not hardware vendors, you know, that's not our business. Um, and I think that there's a lag in the hardware companies uh, where they're not really looking to, they're not asking the right questions. The question is, how can I provide performance and, and and energy efficiency at the same time. And I think the answer is there is an answer, um, but I don't think that most of the companies that are designing those chips and designing those boards are thinking that way. They're thinking, hey, can we get more performance out of the board? But they're not necessarily thinking, hey, can we get it to be more energy efficient at the same time? Um, I don't think they're orthogonal, um, but I think there's a, a sense in the community that there might that might be the way of thinking. Um, so I, I think there is absolutely a, an opportunity here to radically rethink the components that go go into um, you know what constitutes a network. Uh, you know I, I think we've already seen huge changes. You know solid state memory, right? No, nobody nobody puts spinning disks in there in uh, any of their infrastructure anymore. That's just one example. And that, that changed very rapidly just, uh, just a few years ago as the cost of, um, of uh, uh, memory, you know, uh, persistent memory went down. Uh, so it, I, I, I think the, you're, you know, they're onto something. The, the industry does have to start thinking in radically different ways but I, I you know the telecoms are ready i think we would support it i mean oran is is one example uh where we are we are actively supporting that okay excellent insights there beth thanks so much uh paul what do you think i mean is, is should the focus be more on the uh the underlying hardware capabilities or design of the underlying uh hardware uh, components well, maybe a uh, disruptive comment, but I'm going to say absolutely not. Um, I think the points that Jeff, Sandro, and Beth raised are all accurate. The perspective I'd add is that if you look at the silicon, and of course, silicon storage, networking technologies, accelerator technologies, these are all key parts of the solutions that are being built across the telco network. 
But to have an advancement there replace the initiative around disaggregation and virtualization would be incredibly short-sighted. The the silicon performance and advantages will continue to be present, but that's only a small piece of the overall challenge that we have. And if you look at what disaggregation, and I think Sandro was the one that mentioned the, the openness and, and optionality that you have with respect to disaggregation, that's fundamentally transforming the business model that the service provider has and placing them in a significantly more advantageous position commercially. Um, for example, in, in the legacy approach, even with better silicon, a you know one or two vendors might compete at the be beginning outset of a network build out, win that service provider's business, and then command ownership of that network for years, eight, potentially even decades. And that's a very weak position for the service provider to be in. As we've moved to disaggregation and virtualization, you now have competition at the COTS layer from hardware platform vendors. You have it at the virtualization layer where we participate and at the application layer where now the single click of an orchestrator can swap out a vendor that's used as an application in the service provider network. This creates a paradigm where there's competition for the entire life of the network that drives TCO down dramatically year after year after year. And this, you know, looking at the silicon role there, it's a piece of it. But that business transformation that I just described is far more critical to the service provider managing TCO. If you then layer on top of it, as Beth mentioned, the fact that the network is being used for new applications, new revenue streams to be able to build for service providers. We look at the edge of the network where automotive V2X applications, V2I, accident avoidance, drone delivery, private 5G with augmented reality and manufacturing environments. There's a tremendous amount of revenue generation possible once you've fully virtualized the network. And to you know, dismiss that for an advancement in silicon, I think would be very, very short-sighted. Perhaps disruptive, but that's how I feel. All right, Paul, I think uh, you're, uh, there's gonna be a lot of agreement uh, on the panel uh, here today with that view. Uh, John, we'll come to you next and, and then back to, to Jeff to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll try and keep this quick. So I, I don't think we can look at these as separate things. I mean, obviously, there needs to be improvements in compute uh, and and, and uh, silicon architectures, but that, that doesn't mean you don't look at other parts of the network as well. They're, they're highly intertwined. And if you think of the optical networking layer, most of the advances that we have today in the move from 100 to 200, 200 to 400, 800 gigs per second wavelengths that we're shipping today, 1.2 terabits per second, 1.6 terabits per second coming along in the roadmaps. Most of that advance, advance in the optics, ugh, get the words out. Most of the advances in the optics come from this, the amount of processing we can get in the DSP that we use to uh, to, to shape and, and process the signals. So what we do in the optics world is driven by the silicon world as well. What that enables us to do is not only get higher and higher capacities in wavelengths, but also shrink the size of the components we use. So if I'd, uh, if I'd known this question was coming, I've got a QSFP DD optic on the other side of my office over there, and I could have grabbed it and shown you how small we have 400 gig optics today. You know, you literally put them in the palm of your hand, and it wasn't that long ago that would have been half a rack of equipment. And once you have that, you can then start to look at architectures where you take effectively the, the DWDM transponder, plug it straight into a router, plug it straight into a switch, or maybe even plug it straight into those server blades that, that we're talking about in, in sort of optimizing elsewhere in the network. So I, I, yeah, I think obviously we really have to look at all these areas uh, and, and do whatever we can with the technology we have and the improvements in uh, architectures and standardization and drive this through all layers of the network, really. I don't think it's an either or question. It's each part of the network needs to look and see what it can do uh, to help improve improve economics, speed up innovation, and improve flexibility. Absolutely, great points there, John. Uh, and uh, Jeff, we'll, we'll come back to you to, to close this one out. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I'm thinking since we, we suddenly went down the hardware, hardware route, then maybe a case study is a, a good example. Because uh, we, we have a very close co-innovation relationship with Intel. In the same way that AWS is developing uh, silicon for very specific reasons, we are co-innovating and building on what Intel already has done, but we're optimizing it for very specific workloads. The example that we have is that we know in Rakuten Mobile in Japan, we're doing an initial rollout of 30,000 distributed units. Uh, 
in that we have designed them very closely with Intel, and this is very similar to how AWS does things. What can we remove and what can we optimize to make that the most efficient rollout we can? Now, some examples here is that we actually have a two board structure inside this distributed unit. So we have an IO board and we have a just pure processing board. Uh, that processing board can then be swapped out because it's generic COTS. The processing board has a fan design for the components. The reason we did that was because we wanted to maximize the cooling on that board because we didn't want to have any active cooling. There is no fans in this box, which means there's no moving parts. We're not paying for a fan. It doesn't break. We don't need field maintenance. And all of that reduction allows us to have one person walk up to a site, plug it in. And what it really ends up being is an outdoor edge compute appliance that happens to be running at the, mode man, at the moment baseband uh, processing software. We're a software company, but we did that because the economics to tailor what we needed to do and remove things we didn't need was valuable to us. Uh, and I, I recommend anybody views the, the same journey. It's really through an economic lens. So all great points here. And the takeaway here appears to be, let's innovate and make advancements in every aspect of, uh, of networking uh, and not just one or the other. Um, but uh, great question uh, and some great answers and very insightful answers as well. So thanks uh, to the panel here today. And Guy, back over to you for the next part of the programme. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. Um, it's my favorite time now. It's time to check in on our audience poll for our Open Telco Infra Summit. One question, seven answer options, and you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And the question we're asking this week is what are the main barriers to realizing a broad and diverse Open Telco infrastructure ecosystem? And you can see the real-time votes right here. Well, uh, there's an obvious outlier there in um, insufficient interest from CSPs. That's um, that's good to hear that, or good to see that that is a very low number. And it looks as if um, concerns about interoperability and integration, obviously um, quite high on people's uh, radar there. Now, if you have yet to vote, then please do so. It's a load of fun. And the more votes we get, the better, because we analyze the results afterwards. Uh, and uh, Ray will, um, will, will uh, put that in the telecomtv.com website. Now, we're keeping the polls open and we'll take a final look at the results in tomorrow's live Q&A show. We've got another ooh, 10, 15 minutes or so remaining. So there's still time to answer some more of your questions. So back to you, Ray. OK, thanks, Guy. Uh, now, looking at those poll questions, it, it is clear because people are able to vote for uh, as many of the options as they think relevant. Quite a few of them ha have uh, uh, attracted quite a lot of votes. So there do seem to be quite a lot of concerns uh, about the, the, the barriers to uh, building out and expanding uh, this ecosystem. So I'm just wondering if the, if the panel has uh, any views on, on, on the results so far. So. Uh, uh, Beth, any, any thoughts here? Any surprises or anything you want to pick out from those poll results? Um, yeah, what, what jumped out at me is, is how all over the place it was. Um, and um, that it was, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the incumbent vendors, um, that jumped out, you know, that was 50%. Um, I, I have actually personally seen that uh, where, you know, we've, we've come out with something that, that potentially um, gave, uh, allowed, the, allowed the telco more, um, more control and the vendors have responded, um, you know, in, in ways that sort of tried to take that back. So I think that that was kind of what jumped out at me is that there's definitely tension between uh, the uh, uh, more use of open source um, and with the vendors, because it could, it doesn't have to be, but it could actually be seen as competition. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's clear 
there's still a lot of talk uh, uh, about this, uh, as we all know, I think, uh, in this sector. Uh, John, anything there from the, the results that stood out for you? Uh, mainly, I think that the, 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 the getting the high result for uh, the need for integration or the concerns around integration, uh, that's exactly what we see. Um, you know, if you look at, I mean, obviously, I've got a very optical view of this. If you look at certain parts of the market, like subsea cables or the big uh, data center guys, they've been operating in open modes for, for many, many years. But as we sort of migrate carrier networks or telecom operator networks to the same sort of architectures, there's a need to 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 overcome those barriers. There's all the operational aspects I mentioned before, the standardization work. So we see it every day, um, and we have to help our our customers with that migration. Um, so that didn't. I was quite pleased to see that that's the top thing because that's what we you know that's what we observe in our day to day business as well. Okay. Uh, so, but interesting that it dovetails. So this is uh, you know we're getting a, a real feedback real feedback here, here from the. Uh, from the telco community. Uh, Paul, let's come to you next. Anything you want to pick out? Yeah, I find that to be an incredibly insightful survey, uh, really accurate results, at least uh, as we've talked with a lot of service providers globally. We're seeing, obviously, one of those components really alluded to cost and TCO, which we've already discussed today. Uh, as Beth mentioned, the hesitancy from existing telco equipment manufacturers to shift to a new business model where they may lose components of their revenue. They're obviously resistant to that. But that item that's over 60% really talks to the friction and complexity of adopting a disaggregated architecture. And, uh, you know, as, as you look at uh, bringing things like Kubernetes distributed infrastructure as you need for ORAN to host virtualized RAN and open RAN solutions. This is, it's not trivial, right? It's a fairly complex solution to, to build and deploy. And I think your survey reflects that. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we've actually partnered with Dell to build Wind River Dell infrastructure blocks that allow us to remove some of that friction, have a pre-integrated solution that can be brought to the service providers that's easier to deploy and operate. I think that talks towards the ecosystem. We really need partnerships and integration happening outside of the service provider environment. So the burden is not always on the service provider to integrate the complete solution and deploy it and build that expertise. By integrating these things outside in ecosystem partnerships, such as the one I described, we're able to take learnings globally and have them usable by many service providers as they consume the solution. So that resistance, that, that item, I think it was 62% or more, that's a very real result. And it's a result of the complexity of this aggregated solution, but there are ways to solve it. Okay, excellent points. Uh, uh, Rani, anything in the in the concerns of the community there that surprised you at all? Well, uh, quite the opposite. I mean, I'm not surprised. What I'm reading between the lines is that the responders are daunted by this new mode of operation of open collaboration without any like central body governing it and directing it and um, questions like who will integrate. So I think all those concerns are genuine and they are there and they're difficult to deal with. But what I might message with is don't let that discourage you from taking part in this open type of collaboration. That's the only way to move forward considering the on networks of the future. And we, uh, one of the tracks is related to the metaverse and what kind of demands it will bring work. And it's like orders of magnitude um, stringent requirements than what we know of today. So there is, I see no other way uh, to move forward and address those demands other than every player in the industry working together on these open platform, open standards, open source projects uh, to address those uh, demands. And yeah, it's going to be tough uh, to begin with. But once you go over the hump, uh, you'll quickly see the benefits and you'll quickly see how it uh, drives you to your goal of uh, providing service to your customers and providing these uh, services. Okay, thanks, Rani. Um, uh, Jeff, let's come to you for the final comment uh, on this. Uh, it seems like there's um, th there are a lot of challenges to expanding or a lot of perceived challenges to expanding the, the ecosystem that everybody seems to want from uh, the, these open telco infrastructures. Yeah, I think it's a really it's a really good uh, survey. If, if I was to summarize it in one sentence, I'd say we want to change, but we're really scared of doing it wrong and we want the same guarantees 
because there's no incentive to me to take that risk. And I think that's the reflection of an industry that isn't really incentivized to take risk at all. Uh, but people do want to change. So that's this dichotomy that we're living in at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. I think you, you've kind of summed up where the where the industry very much is at, at this point. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's almost in a, in a way being uh, forced to do stuff that uh, that it wants to think about a, a little bit longer. OK, uh, great insights there. And obviously these uh, please do vote in the poll. These are uh, uh, real votes changing all the time. So the results will have changed by the time we look at it tomorrow. Um, so uh, have your say, vote in our poll. Uh, so Guy, back over to you for the next audience question. Yep, thank you, Ray. Um, hot off the press, we've just in the past couple of minutes got this question in. So let me, uh, let me read out the question to our guests. Um, if vendor A's application is running on vendor B's operating system, on vendor C's hardware, then Basically, who is responsible when something goes wrong? Uh, as things always go wrong, um, who takes responsibility? Is it one of the, is it vendor A, B, or C, or is it the uh, is it the telco who's who's hosting? Um, then, the more complex we get, the more the more variables. Uh, Beth, uh, what, what what are your thoughts? Um, sadly, it is the telecom who you know we're the ones that interface with the customer, so we are the ones that take the blame. Uh, when when that happens, the integration you know fails, or you know some component fails. Uh, you know we we are the first line of defense. Uh, it, we're the people that you know the help desk gets called or whatever. So you know we then have to take it back to the v various vendors, and of course, frequently the answer is not vendor A is at fault. It's frequently the interaction between vendor A and vendor B, and possibly some, you know, weirdness about vendor C that has, you know, kind of made the mix not work quite, quite as it should. So, you know, as a telco, you know, as mentioned earlier, we are very definitely cautious. I should point out the reason we're cautious is because we are running a network that people expect to work 100% of the time. Uh, and uh, so what we do is a huge amount of integration testing and regression testing to make sure that all those components work together. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like it can be an absolute thankless task to be a telco at times. Uh, you know, you take all the all the brunt of the of the uh, users' criticisms and uh, and complaints. Um, so we've got this um, this theoretical network scenario. The our audience members mentioned. Um, Sandro, uh, what what's your comments? Um, is it is it one of the vendors? Is it something in between? Is it the telco who has to take responsibility? Yeah, well, there are vendors in the industry that are positioning themselves to actually help with that, right? Be it through uh, simply providing uh, a service, right? Be it through, uh, you know, pre-engineering solutions jointly with partners and kind of providing the support for that specific layer. Like one good example is what we announced with Wind River uh, a month ago or so, where uh, with the infrastructure block for, uh, for the foundation of the network, in this case, more focus on open RAN, Dell is actually taking full responsibility over the support for not only our hardware, but also the, the, the software stack that, that Wind River provides as part of the solution. And uh, I think we're gonna see more of that. And especially as we consolidate in the industry across specific platforms, then uh, you'll see more vendors actually positioning themselves as a as a, a provider of this kind of a first call support and basically taking ownership of the of the support for the solutions they they are providing or integrating so for the vendors uh, sorry for the operators that do not want to take uh, this responsibility upon themselves for sure there will be solutions there will be options out there on the market Good to hear. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, John, we'll come to you in a second, but let's first of all uh, pop over to Paul. Thanks, Guy. Uh, yeah, Sandro's dead on point. I think that obviously having some options here where you simplify um, that service job recovery and SLA performance that you need to have as a vendor 
in the network is critical. That's another example of being able to simplify the problem for the service provider. In the end, though, that particular example, vendor A, B, and C, and we happen to be vendor B often in that in that exact picture. Um, we have to have service outage recoveries, TL9000 compliance support, the ability to jump into the network and work with those other vendors cooperatively. Beth's correct. They own the end customer. The end customer is the one that has the disruption in service. And make no mistakes, a lot of these services are lifeline services with emergency 911 and lawful intercept services running over these networks. It's critical infrastructure, often government regulated. And so we, we play a part in that. Um, but make you know, make no mistake, the service provider owns this and in effect, disaggregation actually doesn't change the problem a lot from what they've been dealing with for decades. Whether if you look back at IMS and interaction with cores and session border controllers and, and transcoding elements coming from different vendors into the network, that interoperability in the live network means that all of those vendors have to jump on the call and disaggregation with vendor A, B, and C, we're gonna do the same thing, right? We have to all jump in and make sure that the service provider's network achieves and exceeds five nines of service availability. Um, and to Sandra's point, the ability to position options to the service provider market to simplify that interaction, to get better responsiveness and faster expertise into the network to perform that uh, service is really critical to easing adoption of these new technologies. Thank you, Paul. Some, some uh, very good points there. And uh, yeah, it's um, as, as you say, these are critical networks. Um, Rani, we'll come to you in a second. But first of all, um, let's hear from John. Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll try and be quick because obviously I think we're coming towards the end of the time and I'll leave time for the others. Uh, so, yeah, I fully agree with what Paul said. What, what I was going to add to it, though, is that there are industry bodies like TIP that are absolutely addressing this, this challenge. If you look at what they've done with the segregated cell site gateways, they're building the whole sort of ecosystem around segregated hardware, white box hardware from various vendors, and then and then routing software from, from other vendors that runs over the top. And they're also doing similar things with the optical layer uh, about trying to build more inter interoperable networks. A good example is they've just certified uh, one of our products um, for uh, uh, one of these products I mentioned, 800 gig wavelengths uh, for exactly that sort of in interoperability through through their what they call their TIP must certification, which is a lot of it around the open interfaces, open config interfaces to allow easy integration of these devices. So, yeah, so the bodies like TIP are absolutely addressing this as best they can. But ultimately, as Paul says, you know, this is a you're still going to need vendors all coming together on the rare occurrence where something may may horribly go wrong. Yes, as you say, so there's a number of associations helping in this matter, um, and that's good to hear. Uh, Rani, let's come across to you. Yeah, so going back to the original question of uh, who's throat to choke in this ABC scenario, I've been hearing that for over a decade now, ever since disaggregation became an idea, but I think we live in a day and age now where this question should not exist anymore. We have a plethora of, of tools and methodologies for doing uh, telemetry, network observability. So if some issue arises, uh, we should have all the information to know with not just which vendor, but which module of the software and which developer wrote it and uh, pinpoint it right to the uh, root cause analysis. Uh, so I think this question nowadays is becoming less and less relevant because we have all the information and we can pinpoint that very quickly. And I think the next stage that we'll see is that these problems will be able to solve themselves by intercommunicating between uh, these ABC uh, software vendors and actually one part of the software asking the other part of the software to actually resolve the problem automatically based on those uh, telemetry and observability data that is gathered and those automations will just uh, do us away with that problem altogether. Great, that sounds very positive, Rani. Now we've just got to, we've got to get that message out to the community. Um, which we will try and do in our summit series. Uh, now, time is approaching the end of the show, but uh, Ray, we do have time to squeeze in a last question. Uh, yes. So uh, a question, I think uh, it looks like the, the poll has been the catalyst for this question. Uh, and the question is, how do we make things more welcoming for incoming telco vendors. So, I mean, one, one of the big things about uh, open networking is supposed to be that it's going to encourage uh, new companies to be coming in with, uh, uh, particularly with new software, with new applications. Uh, but one of the big challenges is uh, how do those companies uh, get a voice? How do they get heard or seen by the network operators that ultimately 
uh, they want to do business with. So how can this industry make it easier for new entrants, new companies who have got innovative uh, new ideas for the for networks and services? Um, how can they get involved uh, and be seen more easily? Do anybody have some thoughts? Jeff, let's come to you first. Yeah, and, and I think this is a role that the uh, telecom operators have to take on. It's no good speaking about change and starting open source projects unless you're going to invest in the companies and take the risk that they will be successful. That's where all of these initiatives are failing. People are willing to come into telecom and innovate, but because there's no path to actual procurement of those companies and trust in those companies to execute, then the change doesn't happen. It goes back to the incumbents. The incumbents have no motivation at all to change. They might want to change their own hidden supply chain to improve their margins, but that's not a pass on uh, transparent to, to any of us as mobile operators. So I think there's a, a provocative statement that says the reason that telecom isn't changing is because the telecom operators ourselves are not brave enough yet to trust that we can take that risk. Brilliant. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to break in. Uh, as Guy said, we're we're getting pretty close to time. So uh, if we can get some quick responses here, because uh, a lot of people want in on this. Rani, we'll come to you next. Uh, what can the industry do to help startups uh, get visibility? Yeah, so there are a few things we're already doing in open source communities, specifically in the uh, Linux Foundation networking. Uh, we have this initiative of Super Blueprints, where many companies collaborate and build uh, an end-to-end -end solution. And what we're seeing is that we have both small and larger companies. Uh, we have startup companies uh, that otherwise wouldn't get the attention of the large operators. And what they're doing is that they're bringing that technology, making it part of this uh, blueprint. And this way, they're proving that um, they can be a player in that domain and uh, that's an easier path for them for adoption with, with their target customers. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Rani. That sounds like uh, something for, for new entrants to get involved with. Um, uh, Beth, can the operators do more maybe in a change in their uh, procurement or RFI, RFQ processes to, to bring more companies into the fold? Well, I actually question the questioner's statement that the, com that the telecoms aren't uh, looking at you know new entrants uh, we absolutely you know and speaking from verizon's perspective we absolutely are looking at new entrants all the time uh we bring them in we test them you know we we look at you know we're we're on top of what's going on with new technology and certainly what you know what granny you know and and we we certainly look to the the open foundations to to help with that process um but i should also remind people that um that you know as a startup um it has often been said that you know uh, we eat them for lunch um, because it's a very difficult to bring in these new entrants, not necessarily because of the technology, um, but because they frequently have a hard time um, supporting the requirements that a big telco needs. Um, and so, you know, we definitely want and encourage new entrants. You know, I know Verizon, uh, uh, invests in them. We've invested uh, in, in, in quite, you know, I'll just give as an example, we invested heavily in SD-WAN technology, um, quite successfully, I should point out. And uh, so that's just one example. Um, but, you know, particularly the really small new entrants, it's just really difficult for us to consume those, the, you know, that technology because the, the the companies don't have the resources to provide the services that we need to do business. And, and again, I'll just use a quick example. Um, you know, we're a, a 
you know, we have business in, you know, 178 countries in the world, and we re are required to homologate any of our services uh, across all those countries. And, you know, a, a small company might not have the resources to, to do the homologation that's needed, that we need to, to use their service. That's, that's again, just some, some simple basic business issues. Yep, I mean it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. I guess the question is asking, can can anything be done differently to uh, to help with these issues? Uh, Paul, we'll come to you next, and then we'll end with Sandra. Yeah, this is a fun one actually. Um, uh, as a first person here, we're a new entrant, right? So I can actually talk to this, and and actually with some thanks to to Beth and to Verizon. Uh, although we've been in business for forty years, as little as five years ago, we were unheard of um, in the in the telco service provider as a direct vendor to them. And as we sit here today, as a result of the, the culture and philosophy that Beth shared, we're running in many thousands of sites across the Verizon network, powering their 5G RAN infrastructure in production. And in fact, as I sit here today with this phone, um, it's running on the Verizon network and running on Wind River infrastructure. So I actually think the service providers are thinking very progressively. They are welcoming new, new entrants. And as a result of doing that, they're able to bring very, very modern, innovative technology uh, such as the cloud technology that we founded as an open source project, Starling X, uh, that is now powering their uh, VRAN architecture in North America. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely uh, would, would want to share that and, and say that I disagree a bit with the premise of the question because we are one of those new entrants and we've been welcomed into their network. Okay, thanks, Paul. And uh, Sandro, we'll end with you on this. What can we as an industry do more to, to help the innovative new startups? Yeah, so I believe that the larger vendors that are committed to, to open disaggregated networks, they do have a role to play in actually easing up the access of startups and smaller companies into the domain, right? So on our side here at Dell, we are doing that. We announced uh, in, uh, in October our self certification program that is basically powered open telecom ecosystem lab where basically uh, smaller vendors, software vendors, independent software vendors can, can get their, their applications certified in our environment, which is the environment that we are selling to our uh, CSP customers. And that helps them uh, in the discussions uh, with, with potential CSP customers by basically saying that, well, I mean, my solution is actually already certified to run in the environment that you're running on your network. And we're gonna to continue to expand that into a larger community to make sure that uh, these smaller companies, they can count on our help to also get to the, to the CSP customers, get to the telecom operators out in the world. So, and I believe that, well, other big vendors that have a good presence in the telecom world and that are committed to open solutions, uh, yeah, they should do the same. Okay, great point to end on. Thank you, Sandro and Guy. I think that we are or have already run out of time. Uh, yeah, we, we, they're paying us overtime today. We are out of time now. Uh, thank you so much to all of our guests who joined us for this live program. And of course, to our audience for sending in their questions. Uh, unfortunately, we still have several remaining, which didn't get answered, but we'll try and add them to the mix for tomorrow's show. Yeah, and do remember to send in your questions for the live Q&A show as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. The earlier you get them in, the better chance of them being asked. And don't forget the poll question. There's still time for you to vote and to have your say. So please vote now. Yes, please vote now. And join Ray and me again tomorrow for the final live Q&A show for this year's Open Telco Infra Summit. Goodbye for now.